Yeah. Just Molly. Well, what are y'all doing? I need a book. Here you go. Here's another. I brought one, but I don't think to have it. Uh, um, I did have one other thing I needed to do before we, we continue on with our worship. Um, and I'm sorry, that shows how much attention I'm paying to the keyboard that I didn't know we'd already had our friends. So I apologize for that. But this is from Glenda, Lynn, and Mike. Dear church family, for the prayers, cards, and remembrances after Freddie's death, thank you. Your attendance at the visitation and funeral service from the many people, and Freddie knew many people, was greatly appreciated. It's been a sad and shocking time for us. Please keep us in your prayers in Christ's name, Linda, Lynn, and Mike. And we certainly do continue to keep them in our prayers. Um, and I am going to mention, too, that uh, I noticed Doris, Doris Phillippe has a birthday this, I believe, coming Friday. I don't know. I think Doris is still going to be in her 80s. But uh, let's keep Doris in our prayers. And uh, Bradley and Kim won't be, of course, around next week, but they're going to be celebrating a 14th wedding anniversary coming up. Next week? Um, week after. Or the week after next. <laughs> I'm not going to have you stand because for some of you that might be a little bit of a challenge uh, given our seating situation, but I am going to uh, refer you to the uh, bulletin where it says Affirmation of Baptism.
You renounce the powers of the world that rebel against God. Do you renounce the ways of sin that draw you from God? Do you believe in God the Father? I believe in God the Father Almighty. Do you believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God? I believe in Jesus Christ, the only Son of our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered in the Pontius Pilate, was crucified and died and was buried. He gave the same gift as the Son. On the third day, he rose again. He was in the end. He is the Son of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit. Do you believe in God, the Holy Spirit? of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. O God, we thank you for your Son who chose the path of suffering for the sake of the world. Humble us by his example, point us to the path of obedience, and give us strength to follow your commandments. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. We will now hear God's word. Woman on 
incurable, refusing to be healed. Truly, you are to me like a deceitful book, like waters that fail. Therefore, thus says the Lord, if you turn back, I will take you back, and you shall stand before me. If you utter what is precious and not what is worthless, you shall serve at my mouth. It is they who will turn to you, not you who will turn to them. And I will make you to this people a fortified wall of bronze. They will fight against you, but they shall not prevail over you. For I am with you to save you and deliver you, says the Lord. I will deliver you out of the hand of the wicked and redeem you from the grasp of the ruthless. The word of the Lord. Join me in reading responsibly the first eight verses of Psalm 26. Give judgment for me, O Lord, for I have lived with integrity. I have trusted in the Lord and have not faltered. Give for your steadfast love is before my eyes. I have walked faithfully with you. I have hated the company of evil doors. I will not sit down with the wicked. Singing aloud a song of thanksgiving and recounting all your wonderful deeds. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 16th chapter. From that time on, after Peter had confessed that Jesus was the Messiah, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord. This must never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Then Jesus told his disciples, if any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. 
For what will it profit them if they gain the whole world but forfeit their life? On what will they, or what will they give in return for their life? For the Son of Man is to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay everyone for what has been done. Truly I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. In the gospel of our Lord. In reading through our passage from the 12th chapter of St. Paul's letter to the Romans, I, for some reason, focused on that whole theme of revenge and vengeance. And came across some revenge humor. Some little sayings. I don't know that they're saying, they're certainly not biblical sayings, but the things I came across. Don't go to bed angry. Stay up and plot your revenge. <laughs> revenge is beneath me. However, accidents will happen. I wouldn't call it revenge. Returning the favor is more like it. And then the final one is, the best revenge is to look good. I know in our own society, you know, revenge and vengeance really is much more ingrained than I maybe I would have thought until I started looking through the lesson uh, for this morning from Romans and reflecting on that. I thought back to uh, Clint Eastwood, and he made a career out of portraying the Avenger, the, the man with the gun who renders justice on behalf of others. Um, Eastwood, you know, played this kind of character in many, many westerns, but he made this character most popular in that series of movies. There were five of them, the Dirty Harry movies. Some of you may have seen those from the 70s and 80s, and some of you are too young to have probably remembered that, but you may have seen them in rerun. Anyway, Eastwood was not the first choice to play Dirty Harry Callahan, the San Francisco police inspector, the one who was very quick with his handgun. John Wayne and Frank Sinatra were the first two that were asked about playing this role. And I think about how different it would have been if they had, had done it, but but, you know, it's hard to imagine anyone but Clint Eastwood playing that sometimes violent and ruthless officer. And Eastwood gained his greatest fame as he shot down serial killers and bank robbers and terrorists, among others. And I think for many people, it's powerful, it's exciting, it's even a bit fulfilling in a way to experience to see the good guy take care of the bad guy who so clearly deserves his face. And I certainly enjoyed watching those movies too, but I was, I was glad to see the bad guys get what they deserve. But even when I first saw those movies, I knew my Bible well enough to know that Dirty Harry was at odds with the Apostle Paul. I recall those words from Romans. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave room for the wrath of God. Of course, the idea that vengeance is in God's hands, not ours. But that idea of vengeance, not do to others whatever you would have them do to you, but do unto others as they have done to you and more, I think that's an American tradition in many ways. I, you, you look back at our history, you look at the very famous Hatfield and McCoy feud in West Virginia and Kentucky, the Appalachians in the late 1800s and early 1900s. And they were not the only ones engaged in this sort of family feud, not the game show, but much deadlier. And overall, these different family feuds took hundreds of lives. The most famous was the Hatfields and McCoys, but they were, they were many others. And around 100 people I mentioned died in these feuds, and they were set off by any number of factors. There were political issues, 
There were leftover grudges from the Civil War. Again, that whole area was very divided between Union and Confederate. There were issues over the theft of livestock. There were issues sometimes with the killing of a dog. That set some of them off. Property wrongs, and so on. The feuds usually began in a very small way, but then they would steadily escalate. And there was one feud, not as famous as the Hatfields and McCoys, it was called the French Eversole feud. It probably took maybe as many as 74 lives. And it reputedly began with a disagreement over a woman. And then it escalated to something that was called the Battle of Hazard, Kentucky, November 8, 1889. And, you know, this wasn't just something that happened in West Virginia and Kentucky and the Appalachian Mountains. It was in Texas and the High Plains and, of course, the wars between the different gangsters in urban America. And, of course, it goes on in many ways to this day. In the end, these feuds, I think, proved the accuracy of a statement that had been attributed to Mahatma Gandhi. He said, an eye for an eye leaves everyone blind. Now, early on in the scriptures, well before St. Paul, we discover that vengeance and you're taking it upon ourselves to avenge a wrong, whether it's a real wrong or a perceived wrong. We have to remember sometimes people take revenge and then find out later the person who they were taking revenge against had nothing to do with what happened. But anyway, we find out that this sort of thing is not God's will for us. We find in Leviticus a command from God. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against any of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. And adding I am the Lord is almost a, a, like a big punctuation mark, an exclamation point. It's saying here that this is important. Listen to this. And it says here that in Leviticus 19, 18, it's a way of reinforcing this commitment as, as coming directly from God, this commandment to us, and our commitment in turn before God, that we're to forswear vengeance. And it connects also taking revenge and bearing a grudge to the love of our neighbor. <laughs> love your neighbor as yourself. We don't always connect those two things. I think we kind of try to keep them separate, maybe. But the desire for vengeance, it can push love out of our lives, out of our hearts. And bearing a grudge, that sort of nurturing the anger and harboring hate, plotting revenge, if you will, over time it will transform us, not into being like Christ, which, if we remember from last week, Paul talks about the transforming and renewing of our minds, a transforming of our very lives to be a new creation in Christ. We won't become like Christ if we do this. We're going to become an anti-Christ, if you will. When we harbor hostility or anger or hate or a desire for revenge, others are not going to see Christ in us. And it's self-destructive, physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually. Taking vengeance may feel good in the moment, but over time it will not help us to grow in faith. Now, there was an Australian psychologist. He did a study on vengeance in 2008, and he found something very interesting. He said this. He said, people who are more vengeful, they tend to be those who are motivated by power, by authority, by the desire for status. They tend to be more isolated, less forgiving, less benevolent more quickly, more quick to follow authoritarian leaders and movements and so on. And that same year, there was another group, a group of psychologists in this country, and they found the idea of sweet revenge to be much overrated. They discovered that those who were given an opportunity, in a test they did, they, were, they discovered those who were given the opportunity to take revenge and took advantage of that they were less happy than those who had no opportunity to take revenge at all, which I thought was very interesting. Paul doesn't end his treatment on abstaining from taking revenge there, though. He goes on further, and he gives us a command. Bless those who persecute you. 
Bless and do not curse me. And this is probably a saying direct from Jesus. It's very similar to other things Jesus said. And then later quoting from the book of Proverbs, again in the First Testament, Paul tells us that we aren't to render evil for evil to anyone. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he thirsts, give him something to drink. For by doing this, you will be heaping burning coals on his head. I would have to say here, Paul sounds extremely unrealistic. Who could possibly do such a thing? Refraining from taking vengeance, that's certainly one thing, but then to do good to our enemies, it seems too much. And we think back to Jesus' command to love our enemies. And what Paul is calling for here, though, we need to remember, it's not for being a doormat, not for doing something to make us feel better or superior, as in, Say you've done something bad to me, I'm better than that. I'll kill you with kindness. One example of the effectiveness of showing kindness, or at least a good deed or a good turn towards someone, I heard this from a retired American general who was a veteran of Afghan, of the Afghanistan and Iraq wars, and he said that cigarettes and a beer provide better results when interrogating a terrorism suspect than waterboarding. And that made an impression on me because I thought it was a good, good uh, illustration of what Paul was saying here. Sometimes doing something good for the one we see as our enemy will bring about better results. But there is a higher purpose, of course, for Paul's command rather than just simply getting something we want. Something out of a prisoner we're interrogating or something from an enemy that we want to shame, perhaps. Martin Luther said that the Apostle Paul was telling us that we are to seek the transformation of our enemy, the change of heart and mind of our enemy for their own good. He who is converted by love is completely burned up against himself. For love teaches him all things, and when he has been touched by love, he will exhaust himself in seeking out the person whom he has offended. In other words, the acts of kindness toward an enemy aren't to demonstrate our moral superiority, but to bring them to repentance. And again, we need to remember that repentance is not simply saying, I'm sorry, but it's a change, it's a turning in our life, making a U-turn, if you will, from sin to being Christ-like, from death to life. The church father, Jerome, St. Jerome, he said this. He said, in doing good to our persecutor, we will help cure that person of their vices, burn out their malice, bring that person to life-changing repentance. Now, while harboring that desire for revenge can cause us to burn inside, doing good to the one who has harmed us causes malice and evil in the other to be burned up and hopefully brings them to Christ. What Paul's teaching is certainly difficult, and he does talk about how we are to live peaceably as far as it's possible within ourselves with others. You know, sometimes there are some people who will not, will not change. And in that case, I think we have to just say, we've done what we can and walk away. But for the most part, Paul says, do good to others who have done evil to you. Just try it and see what happens, maybe with yourself. What have you got to lose? No, I think this teaching from Paul is difficult. And maybe there is a little bit of a loophole there about you know living peaceably with others as much as it's in our power to do so. But that doesn't mean this is not a very serious teaching. It's something that comes straight from Jesus. It isn't an option. It's not something we can just sort of you know, check off which three of these four do we think we can handle. It's all of the above. It's just part of being a disciple of our Lord. We can't do it without the empowerment of God and the power of the Holy Spirit working within us. And we remember earlier that power that we have in our baptism when the Holy Spirit came into our lives at baptism. We have, that to empower, we have the Holy Spirit to empower us 
to do these things that just seemed impossible to do. And if we follow this teaching of Jesus and his servant Paul, Paul tells us that we aid in the transformation of others, maybe whether we know it or not. We may not see it ourselves. It may come later. But whatever the case, we can aid in their transformation. But maybe just as important, we aid in our own transformation, our own change. We, we make a difference for eternity. Amen. Gathered in the Spirit, let us pray for the needs of the world. Caring for the church around the world, we pray for a spirit of cooperation among Christian communities of every type and denomination, for the health of congregations during this difficult time when so many are separated, for missionaries and others who share the life-giving gospel of new life in Christ, for our bishops and pastors, deacons, and ladies. Seeing before us your good creation, we pray for the repair of what we have harmed for polar regions, for rainforests, for deserts, oceans, lakes, rivers, ponds, streams, 
swamps and marshlands, for lands dealing with flooding, for those facing oppressive heat, for fields ravaged by storms and fires. Facing so many international problems, we pray for the strengthening of democracies, for peaceful resolutions to conflict, for the people of Belarus, Lebanon, Yemen, and many nations, for researchers seeking a vaccine, for racial and economic justice within our nation, and for all the world, for our legislators to assist the lives of the poor, the oppressed, the homeless, unemployed, and for an ethical election campaign. Surrounded by people with great and hidden need, we pray for families frightened by the uncertain future, for small business owners and their employees, for those whose homes have burned down or been damaged by storms and earthquakes, for those recovering in the wake of Hurricane Laura and those dealing with wildfires in California and Colorado. For students deprived of an effective education. For refugees and prisoners. Aware of all who are sick and suffering, we pray. For all who are facing coronavirus, for those without medical care, <coughs> for those in need of your care, including Corey, Mary, Brandon, Mike, And for others, we name before you loud, silently or loud. We commend to your care all whose needs weigh on our hearts. We each carry our own burdens. We struggle with our faith and trust in you. We carry anger and hurt within us, and we are weighed down with many cares. Help us, Lord, to bear each other's burdens. And help us to be confident of your love for us. And we pray for our own needs. And the desires of our heart. Mindful of all who have gone before us in the faith, we offer our thanks for all the saints, famous and forgotten, for medical workers who have died of the virus, for friends and family we have loved, for the promise of everlasting life with you. In the certain hope that nothing can separate us from your love, O oh God, we offer these prayers to you through Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord. Amen. Let us pray together the offertory prayer. Let us pray. Merciful Father, we Lord, offer with joy and thanksgiving what you have first given us, our times, our time, and our possessions, signs of your gracious love. Receive them for the sake of him who offered himself for us, Jesus Christ our Lord. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me.
Again, after supper, he took the cup and he blessed it. He gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this for the remembrance of me. And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Now this time we uh, encourage you to use the uh, Packets, the communion packets. May the body of Christ given for you and the blood of Christ be shed for you. May the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Let us pray. Pour out upon us the spirit of your love, O Lord, and unite the wills of those whom you have fed with one heavenly food, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. May the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. to love and serve the Lord.